How many people in this room actually do hair restoration? A couple here, okay. So I think it's gonna be good for both beginners and as well as advanced. I wanna emphasize three things, which is artistry, something we don't usually associate with hair restoration, we think is a very mechanical exercise, but I think it can be beautiful and it can be a work of art. Technique and being very specific in what you do. And I think fundamentally what's so important to frame all this is safety. And safety comes with knowledge. And without knowledge, you cannot practice safe hair restoration. So the problem with hair restoration is that it's a question of supply and demand where supply, your donor supply, continues to diminish and your demand for increasing hair loss continues to increase. So you're dealing with an ethical situation where if you transplant, for example, someone 21 years old, they could look great for about 5, 10 years and then have problems at 40. So that judgment is based on years of experience and really thinking through this and making sure you have adequate supply to meet your demands that increase in nature. Going back to a very basic diagram in the textbook of the Norwood pattern, you say, well, why would I put this up here? Because if you don't understand natural progression of hair loss, you cannot create natural results that look good. I was sitting next to a colleague in San Diego, and he was saying, oh, I can spot a you know, fake result a mile away. I said, do you see the guy with the, the hair piece in front of you and the transplant next to you? He goes, no, they don't have anything. You know, it takes you years to understand this. And this is what Malcolm Gladwell talks about, the 10,000 hours when you get to the point where you start to see. It took me years to be able to see uh, unnatural results. And I'm not talking about something really obvious. I'm talking about something very subtle. So hairline design is the first fundamental element of, of beauty and, and creating your artistic statement. I don't like the rule of thirds. I think it's a bit arbitrary. What I prefer to do is understand like a shingling point, which is basically a transition from vertical to horizontal scalp. And that is where the lowest acceptable point is. If you make your hairline too high, you don't create a frame to the face. There's no aesthetic benefit. And if you go too low, it looks artificial and, and won't age well for you. And so what I try to do in my St. Louis course is really walk you through, okay, let's just draw a line. And then let's talk about whether it's gonna be applicable to the person that's in front of you based on the age, the gender, the ethnicity, the uh, degree of hair loss, et cetera. And then just connecting the points. And as you probably know, the lateral limit of a hairline is at the lateral canthus. That's why a comb over looks unnatural because you're drawing hair from the temporal region, moving it medially. And the other thing that's so important is after you draw that initial hairline, go to the side because if you don't look at the profile, the hairline is going downward, sloping downward, that's artificial. It must either go flat if you're being somewhat aggressive or you're being more conservative, it must slope up. And this is one of the things that when I work with my students at the course, I, clearly, I always see this mistake. They don't look at the side and it looks somewhat natural from the front, but it doesn't from the side view. This is something that I haven't published yet, but I'm really convinced this is so important, is using a, a handheld mirror early on in the hairline design. And the reason for this is that the topography of the scalp vary so you you have what looks very straight when you look at them from a frontal view and then when you put them in a mirror it flattens out the three-dimensional topography and it shows you in an instant whether your line is straight or not so you want to draw a quick line see if it works have the patient close their eyes so they don't actually see if your line is way off redraw it go back and use this as a very powerful gauge so the other thing I want you to understand and with this diagram is the idea that if you build a very aggressive anterior hairline and you don't you may look artificial because the temples are not equally matched. The temples and the hairline have to unzip at the same rate. This is why even the most beautiful hair systems or hair pieces may still look somewhat off because the temples are not matched. So the one thing I always use as a caveat is when you're starting out, don't do temples. For the first few years in practice, it's very easy to make a very unnatural result. And it may either be because you can't do the temple well from the low angle and the shape, or because, because of the low angles, your placers that are helping with you, helping you, cannot actually match your angles and damage the graphs as they go in, and it looks kinky and weird. So this diagram is just meant for you to understand, once again, patterns of loss. If someone has significant recession in, on the pink side, you don't want to build this aggressive anterior hairline that doesn't match a temple. So everything has got to match. And again, going back to that first slide of the Norwood pattern, understand what hair loss is before you begin to do hair restoration. This is something as a pearl. I started to actually, even though I do level two conscious sedation, I started to give a, a one cc of quarter percent marking as a superorbital block on each side. It takes two seconds. It makes the anterior ring block much more uh, comfortable, even if they're under sedation. And the big thing though, big pearl, is I don't almost ever have to go back and re-block the front with marking because it just lasts. 
lasts much better than even my marking block in a subcutaneous fashion as a ring block. So I encourage you to do this before you actually infiltrate what I'm showing here is a ring block of initially lidocaine, then subsequently with marking, about 20 cc's. What I'm going to try to do is also address this both to the novice as well as the advanced because the donor tumescence to me is the, the cornerstone of a good harvest. If you don't have good donor tumescence, it's very hard to get a safe harvest. What is a safe harvest? It means minimal transection, no damage to the nerve and blood supply. And when I mean no damage, I mean no damage. You're very, very careful when you're harvesting. And that allows what? Not only a beautiful result in the front, but also a seamless result in the back. Because if you have transected hairs, you don't get a good closure and you get a bad result. So something people don't think about, you do a rapid harvest, take time with the harvest, spend time. It takes me an hour and a half just to harvest a hair. So that's something to encourage you. So that idea, oh, let me go back, I'm sorry. To understand the high tide and low tide is that when you fill that back with tumescence, about 250 cc's of dilute lidocaine and, and saline, you're really, really protecting the corals, which are the nerve and blood supply, and your ship is your blade. So you really want to be very, very careful. It's got to be tense, white, blanched, and firm. This device, I have no financial affiliation with any companies here, so I just don't want you to think I'm promoting anything, but it's been an amazing difference. I don't like using this for facelifts. I still do a tumescence using a hand 25 gauge, uh, I'm sorry, 25 cc syringe, but this has been amazingly easy and fast and so much safer. I don't have to keep on changing the needles out, so I just sit there and pump up this uh, backside of the, the head in very fast incre increments, and I get the whole thing blanched within minutes without worrying about having to uh, change needles out. And the other thing when you're doing harvest, the reason I have this up here is not for you to really understand the intricacies of harvest, but harvesting is so critical that when you're harvesting, you need to actually be cognizant not only of your visual feedback of what you're doing, but also how it feels. It should not feel like you're cutting through wires. You, could, you should be able over time to feel there is a soft butter movement of your blade across there, so you're actually, you, can, you should be able to feel transaction. And you don't want to have that, obviously, and you go slowly. If you watch me harvest, I'm like molasses, because it only takes five minutes to harvest it. So why do it in 30 seconds? You take your time, you minimize transaction, you get excellent results on the back side. This is to show you how little bleeding, how clean it should be, and how minimal transaction you should have with, with a strip harvest. I put towel clamps to take the tumescence down, let that sit, and I want to just emphasize that the trichophytic has been, I've gone back and forth, maybe Jeff will have some comments about it if he does it. I've gone from using it all the time to none to halfway, I'm sort of halfway. The trigophytic is great, it doesn't work on everyone, and the idea of this is that if you take deepithelialize a little bit off the bottom side of your incision, it's, gonna it's go going to be able to let the hairs grow through it. It doesn't always work, but I like doing this in my first timers, because if it looks so good on the second round, I don't have to go back through my old scar and take it out, because I can move to somewhere else. So it gives me a, a much better yield in second pass. I used to do single layer closures, had good results, but I've moved to two layer closures. I was using this 3.0 Vicryl, closure, which I, I liked, but now I really, really like this uh, quill suture. Again, no financial affiliation. Just beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, I think it's a, uh, a monoderm closure with this, and it just locks and seals that wound like I've never seen it. Uh, it just, it's wonderful. And then uh, I close with a 3.0 nylon in uh, uh, brown, brown hair color, and then someone that has like dark black, I use uh, 3.0 proline. And the trick with this is you want to go 45 degrees with your needle passage because what that's doing is it's drawing down your, your superior to inferior wound edge in a perpendicular fashion. That's particularly important when you're doing a trichophytic closure so that the edge actually hangs and perfectly aligns over your, your exposed epithelial edge. This slide is probably the most important slide if you're doing hair restoration. Uh, I, again, no financial affiliation, just want to emphasize that, but this has been a massive change. It's probably the best thing I've done in the last uh, 10 years in my practice for hair. I added PRP, uh, platelet-rich plasma, and A-cell approximately six months ago, thinking this was probably bunk. Who really knows if it's going to work? Anecdotally, it's been phenomenal. Almost every single patient. I've gone from patients that I had one guy that I didn't see growth for 14 months, which is outstandingly long time. He started to grow his second round at four months. Almost all these patients, instead of starting to grow at six to eight months, which is my typical time frame, I'm seeing it at four months. I'm seeing less shedding. The recovery is about the same, but I'm really seeing tremendously beautiful, fast, uniform growth, especially if you're getting some of those poor responders that are not growing hair well. 
I almost feel like this is a, a necessity in my practice now. Almost everyone gets this. An ACE cell, by the way, is um, a porcine bladder um, morselized, and I mix the two together. Sometimes I just use PRP, so I don't have a lot of uh, experience to say whether PRP is sufficient alone. Maybe in six months or a year, I'll let you know that. Uh, this is just saying going back and then doing the marking block is after, after my uh, donor harvest to go and start engaging with the recipient sites. Uh, another big pearl that I, I, start, I start using uh, uh, Toradol, Ketorolac at the end of the case and discomfort levels go a lot lower down for the first couple of days. It's been a really, really nice treatment. I mix it, I pull out about uh, a couple of cc's of actually of the donor tumescence. It decreases the burn so when I inject into the, uh, into the uh, 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 triceps they don't even feel it. And then the, this is the cornerstone. And when we're talking about art, when we're talking about beauty, when we're talking about design, it's the recipient sites to me. Besides the hairline, which is obviously critical, your recipient sites are the expression of your art. And to understand how to create recipient sites, you have to understand how hair differs on each part of the scalp. And so when I was writing my book on hair restoration, I thought about a really easy idea so you guys can understand this, which is a box. So we have vertical planes, horizontal planes of the scalp. And the vertical plane is going to be areas like the forehead, it's going to be the crown, and it's going to be the lateral humps or the side uh, temporal hair going up. And then those transition points are going to be, as I said, the hairline, remember from vertical to horizontal, the lateral crease, and then the vertex transition zone going back from the, uh, onto the vertical plane of the crown. So just when you design recipient sites, it's so important to understand angle, which is going to be vis-a-vis -vis anterior posterior, and direction going this way, and don't worry too much about tilt, that's more of an uh, esoteric idea. So look at how hair grows on scalps. If you don't understand this, if you're not fundamentally acclimated to understand how hair grows differently in the crown, the lateral hump, the lateral crease, the, the hairline, the vertex transition zone, the mid scalp, don't start doing hair. You need to understand, remember, safety is, pr is a prerequisite before artistry, and so understand it. This is an idea, just very briefly, is the concept is that we, when I try to communicate with a patient in terms of realistic expectations, as you know that uh, someone, something told be, before the, uh, the procedure is an education and afterwards an excuse, is that I like to talk about numbers because it makes it really easy to understand this. We're born with about 100,000 hairs on our head, and when we begin to see visible hair loss, visible baldness, we're about 50,000 hairs lost. With each transplanted time, we move about 5,000 hairs. So it's not a one-to-one, -one. and so, so long as the patient gets that into their head, that they're not getting a one-to-one, -one, that's going to be important. So how do we do this? Well, artistic allocation and primary focus on zones that make the most difference is what you need to do. So this is the central forelock, and that's the most important. If you have baldness in the central forelock, you really fail to deliver a result for the patient. So this is the area of primary art artistic aesthetic impact. And then the extended central forelock is more a sophisticated idea is that the, if you look at the central gutter, that's an area that can be very important because it blocks light from all angles coming through. So almost one graft here is equal to two to three grafts on the sides in terms of visual priority. The recipient sites, they should look like, like, a, like a roof where they're all angled together and layered like this. And when you're working on the front hairline, you really can't go too low with the angles. They have to go low. The very easy thing to do is make them too high. I see this all the time. You drop it low, you can almost not go too low and that makes it look natural and creates visual density. Why does it create visual density? Well, because it's like a shingle on a, on a roof. It's covering the bald scalp here. So you want to go very low for both naturalness as well as visual density. So how do you do this? Well, keep the patient in a recumbent supine position. Your hand naturally falls low. If you have them sitting up, you've got to cock your hand forward and you can't do that very well. So interlocking is so important too. And this is what this slide shows. The top portion right here um, is showing see-through effects, but when you interlock them, you can make them more tightly packed and you create more visual density because each row is staggered behind the last one. And I use all different instruments. You can use almost, I like this, it's inexpensive, it's easy, it's small. When it gets dull, I just replace it. And so these are just, uh, just bent needles of uh, 20 gauge accommodating one hairs, 19 is accommodating two hairs, 18 is accommodating three hairs, three or four hairs, and you just bend them and you put that little stopcock there so that you, you keep the distance of the depth the same. Why is the depth so important? Because if you, if the person has really short shafts and you don't measure the depth of that shaft and you make a, a really deep hole, it's, the, the, it's gonna fall in and, and you're, not gonna, you're gonna have either pitting or you're gonna have some other problems. So you wanna make sure you match depth on every single uh, shaft. 
Uh, and then I, the thing that I have loved, and this is something more advanced, I would not recommend you starting this, but micro punches, you can actually take some bald scalp out and visually reduce it. So something I really, really love. And this is just a, a schematic. Obviously, I don't make sites as large as this, but these are what are called diphilic unigraphs. They're, they're two filter unigraphs and something, again, again, a more advanced topic. But the goal is to build the hairline forward. So I first build up the central mid scalp, and then as I build forward, you want to think of the front hairline like a coastline, where you're just building this gentle thing so it's irregularly regular. And sometimes I see there's two mistakes with the hairline. It's either too straight or it's so jaggedy that it's not even natural. It must be microcurrents. And then I go and just finish it with a few sentinel hairs. These one hair grafts that are sitting out on the frontal hairline. So some examples, you understand what I'm talking about. This is a hairline, a male hairline. And the other thing, that you, if you notice this, all the, the sites go forward. Very easy thing I see for a right-handed person is to make sites different from the left and right or splayed open as a book leaf. If you, keep, if you do a radial design of your recipient sites, they'll all open up like this. They'll be uncombable and be, it'll be very unattractive. So you want to keep those um, forward placed. This is to show you just the transition zones going over into the temporal zone. There's the thing that you want to remember when you're designing recipient sites, there are no abrupt transitions on a scalp things move from one to the next area in a very fluid pattern. And so the other thing I notice is when I run this workshop, I see people doing this, and then here, and there's an angle going here. Everything must blend, especially in the crown. And that's a really high-end, uh, much more difficult subject to start with, but don't start with crowns. But this is just to understand natural transition zones. And these are just showing uh, the same thing using punches. Similar thing, just a close-up of different punches. And then this is showing, again, uh, the transitions. This is the crown. But really, if you look, you can see how everything just transitions beautifully. There's no abrupt changes here. There's a female hairline. Again, advanced topic. I can't cover everything in 20 minutes. But the idea of female hair, hair restoration is, once again, so long as you sort of partition what's considered advanced that you shouldn't be doing for the first five years and things that are considered basic, you'll hear from Jeff a lot more advanced topics, which I think would be fascinating even for me to hear. But you want to sort of keep things in perspective of what's safe before you do art artistry. When you have white hair, it's great. You have tremendous visual density. It's harder to dissect uh, for the girls but it's, uh, or for the team. But it's, it's definitely something that creates a very powerful visual impact. A very powerful thing is to help with women. We don't think about women losing hair, but it's 30% of women over 30 lose some degree of hair. And they, and they are even more ashamed of it because it's something that they just can't talk about, unlike for men. And it, it can be beautiful for Asians, maybe easy to dissect, but very easy to create fake results because the, the hair shafts are so thick and so round and the, so straight, and they also have a very dark contrast to the scalp. So these angles have to be particularly low when dealing with Asians. This is just to show you a natural result. What you're seeing on the left is a lot of just sort of bad scalp texture because of the uh, rough placement. Obviously, a natural hairline doesn't match the temples. And you're seeing this almost kinky growth. This kinky pubic hair growth is due to manipulation from your team. So the other emphasis point, emphasis point that I want to create is that your team is everything. If you have a bad team, no matter how good you are as a surgeon, you don't have a good result. And this you're seeing. Uh, compression, which means the grafts are too big to the actual site. They are actually squeezed in. It looks like a plug, but it's not. And you're actually seeing pitting, which is you need to put your grafts about a millimeter or a little less, about a millimeter or two above the surface because they'll rest down. If you put, place them flush or below, they'll drop in and you'll get this, this ugly pattern here. Obviously, the design is poor as well uh, for the hairline. And this here, you see how the problem with besides being a straight hairline and the grafts are being too large, the angles are going like this they got to be dropped down. And obviously, you have to do better hairline design. There's a, a, a hair book that I, I wrote. As disclosure, I've made about $150 this last year. So clearly, I'm not feeding the family with this. Uh, but I'm very proud of it. And I run a course in St. Louis. There's some brochures outside in the re registration area. Um, it's a very intimate experience because it's like a 5 to 1 faculty uh, to, I'm sorry, student to faculty ratio. And, I, I, w and within two minutes, I'll be able to see your movement and correct it within seconds. And that's something that's priceless, in my opinion. And the assistance section is also great. Also, the Bahamas, Jeff and I will be speaking there. Uh, great coming up in October. So I encourage you all to come out. Thank you.